Good afternoon, board members, senior staff, members of the public. Um, I'm going to call the September meeting of the Capital Program Committee to order. Do we have members of the public who are requested to speak? Ms. King. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. We have five members of the public registered to speak today. We have four in person and one remote. I would like to remind all public speakers to please adhere to MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our pu public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Lastly, please be aware that a warning beep will sound, letting you know you have 30 seconds to conclude your comments. Our first speaker will be Christopher Greif. Following Christopher Greif will be Deborah Greif. It's a great thing. Good afternoon. Hope everyone's doing well. I'm here to, as we're talking, hi, Jano, it's great to see you also. And um, just want to wish the one thing I want to add in on the Capitol, as we're getting ready to do the RFPs, I know that I'm hearing A, Sheepset Bay, B, Church Avenue, and other stations in Manhattan, like 14th Street on 6th and 7th. I hope I am here to support those elevators or ramps and i'm going to be clear on every list that's coming up we want to make sure that the public and the community are hearing definitely hearing this that we want to make sure that every train station every railroads that are truly ada accessible proper lighting proper signages and want to make sure that we are, i'm here to support this one million percent and want to make sure that the future of accessibility is still continues especially we definitely need to look at one elevator and it's 175th Street which we all know it's EL 123 which is the plaque of Edith Prentice which I call it the Edith Prentice elevator it's been breaking down a lot and my concern is is and I'm here because I'm concerned of the safety of the customers who uses that elevator and yes it is old but I will say this, if that elevator can please be fixed, if it has to be switched from another elevator being renovated, I will make sure, I'm saying this for the record, if you have to take the plaque out for temporary construction, I have no problem holding it in my house for safety because Edith Prentice is a special friend to me and she was always told me, always keep advocating. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Deborah Greif. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm all bundled up because it's freezing in here. But my, I wish that I, if a genie came to me right now and asked me my first, all my wishes, and everyone would say, oh, you probably want money. No. I want the New York City subway system 100% accessible. That means you can get either in by ramps, Escalators, and not just the steer kind. I like the ones when the next six, I major myself, 1964, 65, World's Fair, you know, the flat one, that kind of like it's a moving sidewalk. That would be wonderful. I would also like to see stations ramped. And I will give you my list. Graves and Neck Road, Avenue U, Avenue M, Avenue J, because you already have Avenue H. And let me tell you, it's been a big help. Because if something goes wrong with the queue, either northbound or southbound, we can get off and just go down the ramp and then go to one of the accessible buses. That makes life a lot easier. So that's why, wherever you can, please ramp them all so, because ramps don't break down as fast as an elevator or an escalator. Also, please make sure the signages are bigger and better. It is very hard, I'll give you an example, on Fulton Street for the, a or I have the hardest time finding when I come out of the elevator, I can't see where the boarding is. So it makes it hard. So please, I hope we can make sure that signage is also prioritized, but where we can really see it. Because it's hard when the place is crowded and I'm trying to get to the middle of the platform or just make the whole platform the same way. So then this train, the elevator's the last at the end. I could get my walker on and I'm on the train already. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have Charlton D'Souza. And following Mr. D'Souza, Jason Anthony. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlton D'Souza. I'm the president of uh, Passengers United. And I want to talk about a couple of things. Yes, we need ramps throughout the subway system and even a ramp at Hollis. Um, we need a lot of AD accessibility, elevators. A lot of the elevators are breaking down. At Court Square, the, el uh, the elevator and escalators have been down for weeks now. Uh, this is Court Square on the number seven line. So that needs to be looked into. We've gotten a lot of complaints about that. Also, I want to talk about the Queen's Link. Um, I understand that the mayor decided to build a park instead of supporting the Queen's Link. And we need transportation in Southeast Queens going from Northeast Queens through Southeast Queens to Far Rockaway. Very important to extend uh, the M line, you know, all the way out to Far Rockaway. Uh, so we need transportation infrastructure that would relieve overcrowding on the Q52, Q53 buses that would also take hundreds or thousands of cars off Woodhaven Boulevard. And it would save commuters 45 minutes to an hour each day in commuting. Um, so you want to get people out of the cars and on to mass transit. The Queen's Link is the way to do that. Um, and the other thing I would say is we need elevators at Mediola on the Long Island Railroad. Um, that needs to be fixed because we're being told, you know, the elevators are being built, but where is it? So far, we've only seen the existing elevators there. So I hope that that gets dealt with and that should have been already built. The elevator, the new elevators are not even built yet at Mineola and that concerns me. And also we've been told Hollis is going to be fixed up, uh, you know, but we haven't seen the plans yet. So we need to see those plans. Very, very important. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much, guys, and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Jason Anthony. Hey, Jano. Hey, Jamie. Jason Anthony from the ALU. Uh, I kind of disagree with the previous speaker. Let's be inclusive instead. But in a, in a, let's be, let's mention East New York. That station is abandoned. Or even though that's a street level, it could be accessible. Let's mention 14th Street on the 6th Avenue line, even though that's in process, but it's connected to the 14th Street on the Broadway 7th Avenue line. It could be accessible as well. What about 6th Avenue on the Canarsie line? that it should be fixed because every time that I take the L as a Laura, those walls is totally disgraceful. What about the whole Broadway Junction complex on the A, C, J, Z, and L? that serves the whole Brooklyn community, that could serve of more than two elevators in the whole complex. Let's think outside the box. Oh, 149th Street Grand Concourse for those students of Hunter College and 68th Street Hunter College. So let's serve for those accessibility elevators right now. So I'll see you guys in finance. Thank you. Our final speaker is Lisa Daglian. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Lisa Daglian, Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, PCAC. Sorry, I'm a little hoarse today uh, after cheering on our New York teams to victory this weekend. In fact, I'm looking on to root, root, rooting for my home team into October and hopefully even November. Let's go Mets. But unfortunately, too many of my fellow fans will not have the opportunity to cheer on our Amazons in person because they can't get to City Field by transit. Similarly, too many fan tennis fans couldn't get to the US Open for the same reason. It's past time to make Mets Willits Points accessible. 
It's too late to get it right for this season, but there's still time to start planning into next season. All fans should be able to take the 7 or the LRR to the game. It's the best way to get there. Making the area around the ballpark more enticing and welcoming would also go a long way to improving the fan experience. I was excited to hear some of Rich Davies' ideas about how to uh, about how that might happen, and we look forward to working with him and his and his own All Star team to go from concept to creation. And because of all of the players literally involved, making the station accessible should be a partnership with the MTA, Mets, U.S. Open, and the city. On the MTA funding side, congestion pricing is the best way to ensure there's enough money to make this critical project happen and happen soon. We're at a critical juncture in the congestion pricing conversation, and we want to reinforce our position that we need to move forward as, as expeditiously as possible. To be clear, the environmental assessment shows that congestion pricing will reduce gridlock, improve air quality, and, and raise essential funds for vital transit projects. The more exemptions there are, the higher the tolls will be. We do not envy TMRB, but their work is so vitally important, and we're looking forward to seeing them in action soon. So let's go Mets. We're looking forward to the day when we can all get out to the old ball game. And happy birthday, Jano. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the public comment session. Thank you, Liz. And I note the capital uh, copies of the July <coughs> CPC minutes have been distributed and are available on the websites. Are there changes or comments on the minutes? None. None. I'm bringing down the gavel on that. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve? Thank you. All in favor? Minutes are approved. Mr. Uh, Jugerald, are there any changes to the committee work plan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, there is one change to the work plan this month. An update on the Omni program, originally scheduled for today, will instead be provided at the October CPC meeting. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So with that, let me turn it over to Jamie for President's report. A lot to cover. Thank you, Chair. Very happy to be with you today. Um, in our introductory slide here, you see uh, an image of a refreshed Queens Plaza station, uh, which has benefited from a new joint construction and development New York City transit program to make improvements to stations during outages. This is the, the station refresh program. Uh, we were able to do that here while we were working on the Queens Boulevard line signal modernization project. Um, so this is an exciting uh, opportunity we're taking advantage of to make improvements. It's part of the work uh, of, uh, of CND and New York City Transit together, bundling, piggybacking, making sure we take maximum advantages of outages that we need to do our work. Before we begin, I, I want to note that our procurement team will be introducing the results of a, an exciting new diversity and contracting initiative today. It was also discussed during the diversity committee. We're bringing to the board uh, this month a new MWBE uh, architectural and engineering design services program, which will enable $30 million worth of design work supporting our small business mentoring program projects. This is a great use of the recently authorized one and a half million dollar discretionary contract authority that was granted by the legislature. And it's a way that we can ensure that our mentor program projects are implemented end to end from the beginning of design um, through the end of construction by minority and women business enterprises. A little more about that in the, when we get to procurements. <clears throat> Some updates for, uh, for the committee. In August, the governor joined us to commission the second portion of third track with the third and final block scheduled to be completed in October. Uh, this project is on time for a 2022 completion. It is $100 million under budget. The Penn Station, <coughs> excuse me, Long Island Railroad Concourse, the governor uh, joined us this month to open uh, the north side of the expanded Penn Station LIR con concourse. It will be completed early next year. It is on time. It is also under budget. Harlem River Lift Bridge, you'll hear more about that from the Metro North Business Unit today, was completed last month. <coughs> Major state of good repair project on time, on budget. Uh, this morning, we completed the uh, Lower Archer direct track fixation project. Uh, we reopened this line for service after installing new track ties, new concrete, new signal equipment, and third rail cables to replace deteriorated infrastructure. Um, this project is very exciting. We used material and construction techniques 
um, that were uh, very advanced, including uh, installing engineered composite ties that will last much longer uh, and avoid the need for shutdowns in the future. <coughs> this project was completed on time and on budget. I also wanted to mention that um, this week we'll be holding a, a, another town hall on planning for the Interborough Express. Um, you can see the details up there for members of the public, and that project is uh, moving forward as we conduct uh, analysis on uh, locally preferred alternative, uh, which positions us to get into environmental review for the project uh, next year. Um, <coughs> we're focused on uh, Grand Central Madison opening by the end of this year, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time before we get to our business unit presentations to review the capital program's contributions to all of the service improvements that are going to result from Grand Central Madison service. Uh, you've seen this before. With Grand Central Madison opening, the Long Island Railroad will dramatically increase service by 40% overall on weekdays by adding trains into uh, Grand Central, in addition to trains uh, traveling to Penn Station. This delivers vastly increased service to uh, riders throughout Long Island and throughout our system. Many riders will see their commute shortened by up to 40 minutes per day, particularly the 50% of passengers into Penn Station today who head to points east of the station that will be better served by Grand Central Madison. We also will see a 65% increase in reverse peak trains that will be transformative to Long Island's economy as current and potential job centers benefit from a surge in transportation access. Thank you. We expect more resilient and reliable service as a result of improvements across the system, not just additional service. And that's an important point that we wanted to spend a few minutes emphasizing today. In addition to all of the work opening Grand Central Madison and the new service plan from our colleagues at the Long Island Railroad, it's a range of capital investments, most of which have been managed by the consolidated MTA construction and development to on-time and on-budget results that make all this possible. And it illustrates how important and valuable it is that we continue uh, on pace with all aspects of our capital plan. You can see on this plan the snapshot of all of the projects that are getting us there. It's not just Grand Central Madison. A series of transformative Long Island Railroad capital projects are moving forward from the completed double track and third track projects on the Ronkonkoma and main lines respectively, and I'll get into detail about all this in a minute through the transformative project at Jamaica and through Harold interlocking into Penn Station and Grand Central Madison. Um, you, you know, like one, one of the, the, the best ways to put this is that Grand Central Madison and all of these associated improvements is our gateway project for Long Island. It vastly increases service, but it has also modernized the entire regional commuter rail system, which will benefit the New York economy for decades to come. So just a minute on each of these projects to refresh how they all fit together. Double track was a project that added capacity and made the Ronkonkoma branch significantly more reliable. It was a $431 million project that was completed 14 months ahead of its original schedule back in September 2018. Third track not only expanded, or not only will expand, the capacity of 10 miles of the Long Island Railroad main line but it has also rebuilt much of the infrastructure along the line, including eliminating all of the at-grade intersection cross crossings that caused injury and loss of life as well as slowing traffic down, fully renewing six stations, adding six pedestrian overpasses, 15 ADA accessible elevators, uh, replacing or improving eight substations for more reliable service, adding retaining and sound walls to seven and a half miles, and reconstructing seven interlocking. So again, it's really a state of good repair renewal project that also adds capacity. Uh, this project will commission the last block of new track in early October. This is C&D's first design build project, and it's on time and it's under budget, as I mentioned. It's been absolutely critical to unlocking the potential across all of Long Island. We're making capacity improvements at Jamaica Station. Of course, at Jamaica, 10 of 11 Long Island Railroad lines pass through, representing 90% of ridership and traffic. The first phase will be completed later this year, rationalizing the track alignments to streamline routing into Manhattan and Brooklyn, and improving basic infrastructure, as well as building a new platform to support improved um, and much more frequent service to Brooklyn. 
We're in procurement on the second phase, which is a long-term project to improve critical interlockings around Jamaica on either side that will eventually able us to enable us to deal with the infamous Jamaica crawl, which Andrew will be talking about again in a couple of minutes. We have to talk about regional improvements at Harold Interlocking. This is an MTA-led reconstruction of Harold Interlocking in Sunnyside Yard, the busiest interlocking in North America with almost 800 train uh, movements per day. Since 2007, Harold has been fully rebuilt, including catenary signals, track, power substations, other infrastructure, and when the project is completed in 2026, it will support not only the expanded Long Island Railroad service that we're talking about, but also Penn Station access and the reconstruction of the East River tunnels by Amtrak, which is critical to Amtrak high-speed service. One of the ways that we've accomplished this improvement to Harold, though it hasn't always been easy, and as uh, the chair is al always uh, points out, it has cost the MTA more than it should have based on lack of coordination and resources from other railroads, is by creating a regional schedule to coordinate work throughout the Northeast Corridor. That's going to help us a lot as we move into this era of railroads having significant amounts of infrastructure funding, uh, and in fact is, is a best practice that's being discussed with various agencies across the country at this point. And of course, Grand Central Madison, which is not only uh, the largest station to be opened in the United States in recent memory, but also a three and a half mile tunnel project through some of the densest and most economically valuable and active territory in the world. Uh, so we're excited about the opening of Grand Central Madison, but really wanted to emphasize that it's all of these projects all the way along the line throughout Long Island that are enabling this increase in service, and it's building on a real legacy of innovation on time and on budget delivery by MTA c and &D. And it's not just about service. The passenger experience, once railroad customers arrive at Penn Station, has been greatly enhanced by the new concourse project, even while it's not finished yet, which we're delivering without disrupting service in any significant way. And I, I should emphasize, we have similar ambitions to all of this for Metro North through Penn Station access, which has started and will be completed by 2027. So the way I would wrap this up is that this is why construction and development was created at the MTA. We're continually paying attention to what is required to enable this work to come in on time and on budget. We've integrated long-term planning. We're innovating in delivery models, emphasizing strong project management. We're also investigating, continually investigating our costs compared to reasonable apples to apples benchmarks across the system. And we're continually working on new strategies for cost containment, which I look forward to updating this committee and the board about in the future. We're also focused on the 80% of the capital program that is state, state of good repair, which is what keeps the system running reliably. Most of our work is not seen, but is critical to making the system work as we welcome passengers back. And for updates on these state of good repair projects for the railroads, uh, we'll turn it over in a moment to Andrew Wilson and Ziona Rubin, as well as our independent engineering consultant. Thanks, Chair. So, I, I, thank you. I, I just want to say that, uh, Jamie, you just did a, you know, a, a legendary job of summarizing all the different things that have been going on that affect Long Island. And what unifies them is not just that they deliver more service, but they're all being done in, a fa in what I always call faster, better, cheaper, the, 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 the way that the new MTA c &D has committed to uh, being just a, mu a, a much more effective capital program delivery organization. And, you know, at a time when folks are still trying to, um, uh, to deal in stereotypes about how the MTA delivers projects, I think this presentation really speaks to what is the real today's MTA capital program and how it's being delivered. So credit to you and the C&D team uh, for, for, for getting that across and for delivering. Andrew, Mr. Meralpa. Thank you. Great report, uh, Jamie. Um, I love the term fixation. I didn't know anyone had a fixation on the Archer Avenue line. Um, now that that is completed, is there a, a scheduled date for the return of J and Z service? The, the service was restored this morning. Yes. So it's I, back? I'm, I'm just checking. The, yes, the services were And the maps morning. all reflect that now. Thank we're you. never sure the maps are up to yeah, the standard, right, but we're yeah, going to yeah, find yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. So they should. But, but yes, I just want to emphasize, you know, that started July 5th. 
We said it was going to be done in September. It's done in September. It's a very complex project, and it's back. And, and let me yeah. just remind everybody, we did this with the, you know, with the other line that goes into yeah. that area uh, with, a, with a planned yeah. upper archer as well. So this has been you know, two phases of really complicated track work um, that avoided some serious, serious problems, very well organized and orchestrated. So with that, I think we're going to hear from the Rail Long Island Railroad and Metro North. Who's first? Andrew, for the Long Island Railroad, Andrew Wilson. Good afternoon. I'm Andrew Wilson, C&D Long Island Railroad Business Unit Leader. Today I'll be giving you an update on Long Island Railroad's capital program. The new Huntington pedestrian overpass shown on this slide is one of the projects I will discuss. We're working on 120 active projects valued at approximately $4.1 billion. As you see in the pie chart, the projects cross all asset categories. Projects include state of good repair work on track, signal, communications, line structures, and power systems, which will improve service reliability. So far this year, 11 projects valued at $56 million achieved substantial completion. Our 2022 completion, uh, completions goal is $218 million, and we're working to meet this goal. As of September 1st, we committed $279 million surpassing our goal of $243 million, awarding more projects than we initially expected, and we hope to commit even more projects before year's end. One of the uh, most important projects we've been and continue to work on is the Jamaica Capacity Improvements Project, known as JCI. It is a combination of state of good repair work ex with expansion elements, ultimately increasing both capacity and speed within the, the, when the last stage is completed. While some of you have seen the JCI video, um, I know we have some new board members and committee members and thought another viewing may be beneficial. Let's see if this works. The Long Island Railroad's Jamaica Complex is one of the busiest stations in the nation. Hundreds of thousands of regular LIRR customers depend on over 1,200 daily trains to move them to their jobs, schools, and families. With 10 of the 11 LIRR branches running through Jamaica, as well as available connections to three subway lines, 18 bus routes, and the air train to JFK Airport, it's more than just a transit hub. It's a major economic driver for the region. But Jamaica's configuration has not substantially changed in over 100 years, which poses significant challenges to accommodating current and future levels of Long Island Railroad train service. Every morning, the antiquated layout of the interlocking causes conflicts with westbound traffic. In this first example, the westbound Atlantic Branch train has to wait to enter the station until the Montauk Branch and Mainline Branch trains pass. Now a Mainline Branch train has to wait until that Atlantic Branch train passes. And again, just a short time later, another Atlantic Branch train has to wait until Montauk Branch and Mainline Branch trains pass. The Hall Interlocking Expansion Project, part of the larger Jamaica Capacity Improvements Phase 2 program, is the first step in dramatically improving Jamaica's interlockings. By adding additional parallel routes to and from Jamaica Station, the current rush hour conflicts will be eliminated and train routing significantly improved, resulting in a more streamlined commute through the station. The new routes will be added by building a new two-track railroad bridge in the middle of Hall Interlocking. Innovative rapid bridge construction methodologies will be utilized to minimize impact to rail and road traffic during execution of the project. As part of future JCI Phase 2 work taking place in later MTA capital programs, Jamaica platforms A through E will be extended to accommodate 12 car trains. That means less passenger inconvenience and faster train alighting and boarding resulting in less station dwell time. In addition, the JCI Phase 2 program will be implementing additional parallel routes and eliminating existing points of conflict upgrading all existing railroad systems throughout Jamaica, undertaking major state of good repair improvements and drastically modifying track configurations. 
This will culminate in a near doubling of speeds through Jamaica, shaving three to four minutes of commuting time in each direction, as well as resulting in a much more reliable commute for LIRR passengers traveling through the station. Okay, um, as I discussed in February's uh, meeting, JCI is a multi-capital program initiative that will dramatically increase train capacity or fix the Jamaica crawl. Uh, within the Jamaica station area, the railroad's busiest junction. The first phase of the project, JCI Phase 1, is nearing completion and included multiple contracts as well as substantial in-house work managed as one in integrated project. The work included the new Platform F, streamlining Brooklyn to Jamaica service with higher speed dedicated routes. This opened up 17 additional train slots per rush hour within the existing station area, thus enabling the 40% increased Grand Central Madison schedule. With the installation of new high-speed crossovers on the outskirts of the Jamaica station area, operational flexibility is improved and enables construction of JCI Phase 2. The overall project budget has increased approximately 7%, primarily due to increased force account labor costs. JCI Phase 2 is currently in the final stage of design. Due to the complexity of this work, JCI Phase 2, estimated at $1.5 to $2 billion, is being strategically phased over multiple capital programs to reduce customer and operational impacts while maintaining necessary routing capabilities during rush hour periods. We are evaluating the project design and schedule to find ways to reduce the overall construction duration. The first phase or the first stage of phase two is the hall interlocking expansion with its status shown in the chart. The project is currently in procurement with proposals due later this month. For Long Island Railroad force account work includes utility relocations, track removals and connections, and third party contractor access and protection. As seen in the video, JCI phase two includes major state of good repair work and upgrades to all existing systems, improving service reliability. The completion of phase two will increase train speeds, shaving three to four minutes of travel time in each direction, saving an average commuter 25 hours per year and getting people where they want to go quicker. Phase 1B of the Queens Interlocking Project was completed in October 2021. It provided Long Island Railroad train service to the new Elmont Station in support of opening of the new UBS arena. Phase 2 work, which is currently ongoing, will enable regular commuter service to the Elmont train station. Finally, Phase 3 will provide signal, signal and track state of good repair work and upgrades, upgrade the older existing signal system. This will improve service reliability and provide for future expandability. All track, power, and signal work are being performed by Long Island Railroad Forces, and the new signal system will be provided by a third-party contractor. As discussed in February, the ADA stations uh, package one contains nine stations and is a major construction commitment for the Long Island Railroad BU in 2022. Building on the success of other recent ADA station awards, C&D is bundling the stations into a single design-build contract to enable the project team and contractors to gain efficiencies of scale and repetition. The project includes new elevators at the locations noted on the slide, including three stations in southeast Queens, which will make seven, ADA sta seven stations ADA accessible for the first time, while replacing elevators at two other stations. The project will result in 86% of southeast Queens Long Island Railroad stations being accessible as compared to 43%, which are currently accessible. The aim here is to make Long Island Railroad service easier to use. We are currently in procurement and proposals are, uh, were received last week. Finally, I'd like to uh, focus on the railroad's usage of the Small Business Mentor Program to successfully deliver capital projects by highlighting the Huntington Station pedestrian overpass replacement. At Huntington, we replaced the existing east end overpass and constructed a new enclosed overpass, ADA compliant ramp, LED lighting, and security cameras. Our mentor contractor, Falcon Builders, maintained a safe work site while minimizing disruptions to our customers. They are a good example of a promising small business mentor program contractor in action. Long Island Railroad Forces installed new lighting, security cameras, 
public address system and provided construction support throughout the project. With that, thank you for your time, and I'll answer questions following the IEC's comments. Joe. Thank you, and good afternoon. The IEC's report on Jamaica Capacity Improvement Project can be found on page 16 of your committee book. Overall, the project is well along at 92% complete and still forecast for beneficial use in fourth quarter 2022. Since last report, the project team has successfully cut over Beaver interlocking and remains ready to perform the work at Union. Project completion continues to depend on the availability of switch and signal account, uh, force account resources and the necessary track outages. Regarding our budget review, the project EAC has increased $20 million to $322 million. The IEC finds this is due to the higher than expected force account labor costs for track, signal, building, and bridge work. The latest projected EAC is in line with the level of the work that remains. A budget modification is required to increase the budget to this amount. There does remain an outstanding claim by the F platform contractor. On risk, at 92% complete, most major risks have been mitigated. However, risks around force account availability and acquiring real estate easements still remain. The IEC finds the mitigation measures for these risks to be effective. The details are outlined in our CPC book. And that concludes our comments on Jamaica Capacity Improvement Project. Uh, question from Ms. Robert. I think, oh, are we done with Oh, uh, Joe, did you have other projects you were uh, We were going to do Queens Interlocking next. Let's finish Queens Interlocking okay, and then you. go to questions. Okay. The IEC report on the Queens Interlocking project is on page 21 of your book. Overall, the project management is reporting Queens Interlocking to be 16% complete with a budget and EAC of $155 million. With respect to budget, the IEC performed an analysis of the completed work and, uh, and all cost cut categories and finds the project budget and estimated completion of $155 million is sufficient to complete the project's current scope of work. Regarding schedule, the project team is holding to the substantial completion forecast of January 2025. The IEC review of the project schedule and remaining critical activities finds there is a risk of delay of two months to March 2025 due to late design, delivery, and installation of a section of the signal system known as Queens 2, which starts in early 2024. As this work starts more than a year from now, there is time for the project to identify schedule opportunities. The top risks identified by the project team are typical of rail systems improvement projects. Those risks and their respective mitigation measures are spelled out in our report and the book, and it's our opinion that the risks continue to be well managed and have proved effective to date. One noteworthy observation on this project is that this project not only addresses critical state of good repair work, but also goes a long way to fulfilling the operational flexibility needs and custom usability at Elmont Station, UBS Arena, the use of the third track, and once open east side access, all in all, all, in all a great benefit to the riding public. And this concludes Queen's at the Lucky. Mr. Robert. Uh, thank you. Um, We've, we've heard the pros and cons of the Jamaica work and specifically the Brooklyn issue um, with most folks having to transfer to Platform F for the change. And we've heard the response that you're going to have much more frequent service. Um, I just, can we quantify that? I just looked at the schedule and right now, this time of day, it's every half hour or every 40 some odd minutes from Jamaica to Brooklyn. What is it likely to go to? Does anyone know I, that yet? Or? Well, I, Chair, unless you have it, I would, I would defer that, and I, we'll, we'll ask long on rail, our colleagues at the railroad to right. uh, to get back to you. I, I, my understanding is it's more frequent than that. Yeah, I, I think the idea was that the shuttle was going to operate, I believe, on a 15 minute, roughly 15 minute schedule. Yeah. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but the but the more important point, which I think your comments get to, is there are two things going on that are really important. One is. By having more frequent service between Jamaica and Brooklyn, you are enabling folks who are coming to or from Brooklyn to connect to the whole system much okay. more frequently. That's the basic thing. Sure. The other is that the movements, we all know that if you know Jamaica, you know that the Atlantic branch's movement, you saw it on that, that video, the movement of the Atlantic branch trains from the, the, the uh, uh, northern area of the, of the, the, the whole track complex across the ladder to the Atlantic branch is a huge impediment to throughput. So everybody's getting more service in addition to better connections for folks. Now, 
I totally, we obviously sympathize. There are some people who treasure a, a one-seat ride, but the volume of service is also a benefit to a lot of people and gives them a lot more options. And that's what the, the trade-off is. Not every ride will be a one-seat ride, but boy, you get a lot more connectivity. I'm a Brooklyn rider. I go to that Atlantic station and, uh, you, you, you know, you, you have to really pick your spots, especially if you're going reverse commuting. This changes that. So okay, Jerry, do I, you want to comment on that? Because oh. I'm, I'm saying a lot of things about Long Island Railroad Service, and you represent the riders. Well, I, like any project, you have your pluses and your minuses. And I think the pluses outweigh the – when you put them all together, I think the pluses outweigh the minuses. So, yeah, there will be some minor inconveniences for some people. Um, but I think in the long run, it, it's, it's the way to go, the way that you have it planned. All right. So, uh, Andrew, yeah, I was ahead. I was just going to say that um, I agree with Jerry, but if I was a rider that now had, from whatever branch, in the morning rush, let's say, either a one-seat ride to Atlantic Terminal or an across-the-platform from tracks two to three to, a, to Atlantic Terminal, and I was thinking I would have to go up and over, would it, and I was going to lower Manhattan via Atlantic Terminal, for instance, would I then stay on my railroad train to Grand Central or Penn and take a subway rather than have a three-seat ride? Andrew, no one's going to, you, you have a, a computer in your head about the whole system that the rest of us don't necessarily have. But um, on balance, on balance, the volume of increase, the increase opportunities for people to connect to and from Brooklyn. In addition, the huge increase in capacity is what has led us to this point. And, well, you know, we, we really have to be uh, mindful of, uh, you know, not underrating what we're getting uh, to, to focus on the, the fact that there may be somebody who's who, – and, and I, I want to be respectful of those people – who treasure, as they say, not having to connect. But you, of all people, who use the system know that changing between trains is not a horror that has to be avoided at all costs. And we're giving people a lot more service. And, okay. and uh, Chair, I'll just, just, just got the information. So just to quantify that increase in frequency, the Brooklyn shuttle service will be every 12 minutes at peak and every 20 minutes off peak. So a very significant increase in frequency for riders to Atlantic. Okay, Jerry. <clears throat> I noticed on the pie chart uh, you showed four environmental projects. Can you just give me an example of one of those? What's an environmental project? So we'll be uh, re remediating lead at like the Smithtown Viaduct and a, a site like that. I have uh, three others just like that. I want to keep moving and go to North Venture North, so I, I slowed us down. Ziona. Good afternoon. My name is Iona Rubin, and I am the Metro North Business Unit Leader at MTA c and This picture shows the iconic Grand Central Terminal and our lifting of the AC units on top of the Grand Central Terminal for the 7B training facility. On November 16, 2020, we closed a portion of 42nd Street to set up the crane and lift the units over the famous Glory of Commerce sculpture. The work was done at night to minimize traffic and pedestrian disruption at street level. The Metro North Business Unit currently oversees 55 active projects with a total budget of $3.9 billion. The pie chart depicts the distribution of these projects among the various asset disciplines. 84% of our projects are state of good repair which keeps the railroad providing high quality service to our customers. Our 2022 commitment goal of $668.1 million includes $451 million of rolling stock procurement. While you heard about rolling stock at the June CPC meeting, for the non-rolling stock, to date we've committed 45% of the projects and are working to meet the total by year end. We've also completed $262 million worth of projects representing 22% of our entire, entire 2022 goal. Unfortunately, a large project that will not be completed this year due to difficult access or outages and forced account support availability is the Sandy Power and Communication Restoration. 
We are working closely with the railroad to mitigate these challenges, and while we won't complete the project in 2022, we are confident we'll finish in early 2023. The list on this slide highlights some of the projects which have been or are in the process of award. These amounts also include soft costs. I would like to highlight a few of the more important ones. Upper Harlem, Upper Hudson repairs, we are performing priority repairs to 18 stations, including replacement of platform edges to select station, making these safer for our customers. Fulton Avenue South Street bridges in Mount Vernon are the last two vehicular bridges owned by Metro North in the city. And the replacement of the DC substation in Pelham located on the New Haven line, which is critical for service between Mount Vernon and New Haven. The replacement of the Croton Harmon shop, phase five, stage two, is the last phase of the work at Croton Harmon Yard, which completes the reconstruction of Metro North's main shop. The Croton Harmon shop is Metro North's main facility, which services electric cars and diesel locomotives used on the Hudson and Harlem lines. The yard replacement program was initiated to ensure adequate rolling stock storage and that service and maintenance facilities are available when needed to meet Metro North's projected short and long-term operating requirements for the Harlem and the Hudson lines. This project is a culmination of six projects, four of which are designed build to replace old and outdated Croton Harmon shop buildings with modern and clean facilities for Metro North workforce servicing the railroad rolling stock. The key benefit of the new shops is to increase the mean distance between failure, which provides better servicing and thus more cars available for customers. The entire program started in 2001 and totals $975 million. The status of the last stage is shown in the chart with a budget and forecast of $439.6 million. The picture on this slide depicts the newly installed car hoist pits. We are currently working at all levels of the building to install equipment, finishes, and build the south yard tracks. The project is 75% complete and is within budget. The scheduled completion slipped from April 2023 to June 2023 due to supply chain issues affecting equipment and materials used in the project. The Park Avenue Viaduct was built in 1893. It carries 98% of all Metro North trains, 750 trains and 220,000 customers each weekday pre-pandemic in and out of Grand Central Terminal. It is a critical segment of the Metro North system carrying all of the trains east of Hudson. This project phase, phase one, spans mm -hmm. from East 115th Street to East 123rd Street along Park Avenue in Harlem. The project will include replacement of the structure as well as construction of tracks, power, communication, and signal systems. In order to reduce the overall cost and schedule of the entire project, we increased the scope of this stage of this phase to take advantage of efficiencies of scale, shortening the duration by 23 months and reducing the cost by $70 million. The work will proceed while trains are still running. The project team has completed the execution of agreements with the City of New York and the environmental documentation as well as issuing the RFP in August, assuming project award by year's end with actual construction starting in 2023, we anticipate completion in 2028. Lastly, the Harlem River lift bridge carries all trains from New Haven, Harlem, and Hudson lines into Grand Central Terminal. The project included Installation of new composite fenders with walkway and navigation lights, as seen on the right. Installation of floating barrier to keep boats out of the backside of the fenders, shown in red on the left. P rehabilitation via crack repairs and concrete encasement, as shown in the center. Miscellaneous repairs to the bearing and the bridge seats. Safety and miscellaneous improvements, such as lighting protection, handrail, 
access ladders, aerial marks, and lightning protection, and seismic retrofit to the counterweight guides. The project was completed on time and on budget, and within budget. This concludes my presentation. Following comments from the IEC, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Joe? Okay, thank you. The IEC's report on Harmon Shops begins on page 30 of your committee book. Overall, the project is 75% complete, as Yona has just mentioned, and remains on budget at $440 million. Respect to the budget, the IEC's budget review of expenditures to date, cost of re remaining force account and third party work, including change orders and unallocated contingencies, the project estimate at completion will remain within the budget. Regarding schedule, the project has recently experienced a two-month slip from its contractual completion date, which has held since October 2018. So kudos for the team to keeping it close. The IEC's forecast of a four-month delay to substantial completion from April to July has not changed since our last report. Concern over critical supply chain challenges arising since our last report have been mitigated, eliminating the possibility of any further delay from those issues. Also, credit goes to the project team and Metro North Operations for successfully collaborating to avoid a lengthy delay by rolling back the April to December moratorium, allowing critical project work to com be completed this summer. The project team has also been successful in mitigating the major risks to date, typical risks such as testing and commissioning facilities and equipment, and recently procurement and delivery delays due to supply chain disruption occur often on projects of this type and still need constant attention by the project team. And this concludes the IEC's report on Harmon Shops. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Do you have anything else, Joe? That's it, sir. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, there was also there was also a delay in getting operations moved out of one area of the facility, and that impacted on it. I mean, what, it, there was a history that that needed to be overcome. It wasn't just supply chain. Am I wrong, Ziona? Uh, you're not wrong. However, that was that is not correctly on the critical path. And mm -hmm. as Joe mentioned, that was mitigated by working together with operations and the project team to be able to move from the north yard to the south yard okay. in terms of work. So putting on my board member hat, when we talk about supply chain generically, it sounds like, you know, it, it's at risk of sounding like a generic explanation. We should be more specific when, we, when we're reporting to the board because that's, some, some people use that as a, an explanation for virtually anything at this point in our history. So let's be very specific as we go forward. Um, all right. Uh, any other board member comments or cries of pain? Yeah. Just just a quick uh, question for offline. In, in both presentation, I, I heard um, challenges concerning forced account work. Is there any way anyone can get back to me on some examples of what those challenges would be just to help moving forward? I, sure. Yeah, and I, I'll take that opportunity just to say, yes, we will get back to you. The, and certainly... There's always complexity because we have we're we're doing so much work. Um, you know, it's the challenge of coordinating it. But I do want to emphasize to the board just the the value and the great relationship of the force account labor that we have going into our projects. I mean, we have really built great relationships between C and D or maintained those relationships with railroad force account, also the New York City tr Transit force account, and it's we couldn't get this work done w without without the, those folks. So um, so things are going well. It's all, there's always disruptions and coordination challenges, but uh, but we're really happy with how things are going in general. Point well taken. Are there other comments? <clears throat> with that, I'll send it to Mr. Plachaki for procurements. Good afternoon. Construction development has 17 procurement actions being brought to the Capital Program Committee. This month, 15 are in the competitive section and two are in the ratification. I'd like to highlight one of these items, specifically the discretionary procurement that Jamie mentioned in his introductory comments. The action requests board approval to award publicly advertised and competitively solicited all agency discretionary contracts to 13 New York State certified minority owned and women owned businesses. Uh, under these contracts, the firms will have the opportunity to perform architectural engineering design, project and construction management services, inspection services, and other technical activities as prime consultants in support of MTA's capital program. The contracts have a 36-month term and a total aggregate of $30 million. 
Individual assignments will generally be awarded through a competitive mini request for proposal process and will be issued in up to one and a half million dollar increments. The discretionary contracts will continue to support MTA's commitment to providing prime consulting opportunities to certified minority and women-owned businesses on contracts that support our capital program. Similar to the success we've seen through our small business mentoring program, we believe these contracts will provide invaluable experience to these firms and prepare them to take on larger prime contracting opportunities in the future. In the spirit of time, I'll move forward. The remaining items in the package are described in detail in the staff summaries contained within your committee books, and I submit them for your consideration and vote. Can I just ask a question? What's the mini RFP process? These 13 firms will get solicited, okay. and they'll have to, rather than put a bid in, they'll actually provide a proposal to us that'll be evaluated. We believe this is incredibly important for them in order to build their capacity as they move on, because that's the way we solicit all of our A&E projects. So when they get into this mode, we'll be actually working with them, building their skill sets, and then they'll be able to compete um, outside of this. And then that's what we hope to do. And how much time does that save? That saves... 30 days, 60 days, or? Well, I'm not saying it's going to save time. <laughs> it'll, help it'll help develop their skill sets. Plan for the future, right? Yes, okay. But the what mini is, RFPs yeah. will be abbreviated from the perspective of not having to provide their, uh, their requirements right. because they're already in a pool. Got it. And it also, uh, realistically, when, when firms are part of a pre-picked pool that, that is going to compete for work, the probability that they'll put the effort into competing for that work is substantially increased. Right. That's that's yeah. why we do it is so you have, you know, whether it's five firms or 10 firms or 20 firms, at least they know that they're what kind of pool they're competing in and that they've already been vetted as that they're well qualified for the work. So they'll put the time into putting a bid together. And also all the, the insurances standards. and all that are already in place. All the paperwork yeah. they would ordinarily have to provide or already provided up front. OK, so that's true. This is just just to refresh yeah. everybody's recollection. This is part of the effort that Michael Garner was talking about in the last committee meeting to, to make sure that we have uh, MWDBEs who are participating not just in construction but also in the soft cost process, architectural and engineering services, and, and this is an opportunity for that. Okay, with that, may I have a motion? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. The items all carry. I'm sorry. Um, thank you. I think that concludes our agenda today. Does anyone have any other business to raise? Okay. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Randy, thank you. Second. Second. We are adjourned. Thank you.